Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Today is day number 223, and we're looking at Jeremiah chapters 14 through 17. Now, this is an interesting section of Jeremiah because it features a good deal of back and forth between God and Jeremiah. I used to read this as a kid and wonder why God didn't talk to me like this. It wasn't until just a few years ago that I really grasped the fact that he does talk to me exactly like this because he spoke to Jeremiah and he had Jeremiah record these words. So we are going to hear God speaking to us today. But before we listen to him, let's ask that he first prepare our ears and our eyes to see truth in his word. Our prayer for today comes from the book The Valley of Vision, a collection of Puritan prayers and devotions by Arthur Bennett. It's entitled, Reproofs. O merciful God, When I hear of disagreeable things amongst Christians, it brings an additional weight and burden on my spirit. I come to thee in my distress and make lamentable complaint. Teach me how to take reproofs from friends, even though I think I do not deserve them. Use them to make me tenderly afraid of sin, more jealous over myself, more concerned to keep heart and life unblameable. Cause them to help me to reflect on my want of spirituality, to abhor myself, to look upon myself as unworthy, and make them beneficial to my soul. May all thy people know how little, mean, and vile I am, that they may see I am nothing, less than nothing, to be accounted nothing, so they may pray for me aright, and have not the least dependence upon me. It is sweet to be nothing and have nothing and to be fed with crumbs from thy hands. Blessed be thy name for anything that life brings. How do poor souls live who do not have thee? Or when helpless have no God to go to, who feel not the constraining force of thy love and the sweetness of communion? How admirably dost thou captivate the soul, making all desires and affections center on thee. Give me such vivacity in religion that I may be able to take all reproofs from other men, as from thy hands, and glorify thee for them, from a sense of thy beneficent love, and of my need to have my pride destroyed. We also want to pray today for the 90,000 Wandala peoples of Nigeria. The Wandala people get some of their income from trading arts and crafts with other peoples, but they receive most of their income through farming. They are a conservative, male-dominated society residing in northern Cameroon and Nigeria. Polygamy is common, with the first wife being the head wife over the others. They live in small villages or groups of huts that have a particular elder residing among them, usually in the center hut, who leads that village. They are rigid Muslims, and Islam has infiltrated much of their life. And with this heavy influence of Islam, they are not very open to the claims of Christ, which they associate with Western, foreign peoples. The Wandala have the New Testament, but a translation of the Old Testament could be of great use. It is possible for linguists to live among them and produce a Wandala Old Testament and other gospel materials. We pray that Wandala followers of Christ, though few in number, would shine their light by their lives and their words. We pray that the Lord would continue to protect them. They have not yet faced significant persecution. We pray that the Lord would lift the veil of darkness on the eyes of the Wandala people, that they may see their need for the free gift of salvation in Christ. Ultimately, we pray for a disciple-making movement among the Wandala peoples this decade. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, all right, we've got four chapters ahead of us to read, and they are very interesting and full of things to talk about. Let's get started. Jeremiah chapter 14. 
the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Judah mourns, and her gates languish. Her people lament on the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem goes up. Her nobles send their servants for water. They come to the cisterns. They find no water. They return with their vessels empty. They are ashamed and confused and cover their heads. Because of the ground that is dismayed, since there is no rain in the land, the farmers are ashamed. They cover their heads. Even the doe in the field forsakes her newborn fawn, because there is no grass. The wild donkey stands on the bare heights. They pant for air like jackals, because their eyes fail, because there is no vegetation. Though our iniquities testify against us, Act, O Lord, for your name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you, O you hope of Israel, its Savior in times of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? Why should you be like a man confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot save? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. Thus says the Lord concerning this people. They have loved to wander thus. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. The Lord said to me, Do not pray for the welfare of this people. Though they fast, I will not hear their cry. And though they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword by famine, and by pestilence. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, and who say, Sword and famine shall not come upon this land. By sword and famine those prophets shall be consumed, and the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem, victims of famine and sword, with none to bury them, them, their wives, their sons, and their daughters for I will pour out their evil upon them. You shall say to them this word, Let my eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound, with a very grievous blow. If I go out into the field, behold, those pierced by the sword, and if I enter the city, behold, the diseases of famine, for both prophet and priest ply their trade through the land and have no knowledge. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Does your soul loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down, so that there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, but no good came, for a time of healing, but behold, terror. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember, and do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the false gods of the nations that can bring rain, or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord our God? We set our hope on you, for you do all these things. Chapter 15 Then the Lord said to me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward this people. Send them out of my sight, and let them go. And when they ask you, Where shall we go? You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Those who are for pestilence, to pestilence, and those who are for the sword, to the sword, and those who are for famine, to famine, and those who are for captivity, to captivity. And I will appoint over them four kinds of destroyers, declares the Lord, the sword to kill, the dogs to tear, and the birds of the air, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy, and I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth because of what Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, did in Jerusalem. Who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem, or who will grieve for you? Who will turn aside to ask about your welfare? 
You have rejected me, declares the Lord. You keep going backward. So I have stretched out my hand against you and destroyed you. I am weary of relenting. I have winnowed them with a winnowing fork. In the gates of the land, I have bereaved them. I have destroyed my people. They did not turn from their ways. I have made their widows more in number than the sand of the sea. I have brought against the mothers of young men a destroyer at noonday. I have made anguish and terror fall upon them suddenly. She who bore seven has grown feeble. She has fainted away. Her son went down while it was yet day. She has been shamed and disgraced. And the rest of them I will give to the sword before their enemies, declares the Lord. Woe is me, my mother, that you bore me, a man of strife and contention to the whole land. I have not lent, nor have I borrowed, yet all of them curse me. The Lord said, Have I not set you free for their good? Have I not pleaded for you before the enemy in the time of trouble and in the time of distress? Can one break iron, iron from the north and bronze? Your wealth and your treasures I will give as spoil without price for all your sins throughout all your territory. I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know, for in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, If you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious, and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them and I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. Chapter 16 The word of the Lord came to me. You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning the mothers who bore them, and the fathers who fathered them in this land, they shall die of deadly diseases. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried. They shall be as dung on the surface of the ground. They shall perish by the sword and by famine, and their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth. For thus says the Lord, Do not enter the house of mourning, or go to lament or grieve for them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, my steadfast love and mercy, declares the Lord. Both great and small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, and no one shall lament for them, or cut himself, or make himself bald for them. No one shall break bread for the mourner, to comfort him for the dead. Nor shall anyone give him the cup of consolation to drink for his father or his mother. You shall not go into the house of feasting to sit with them, to eat and drink. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will silence in this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And when you tell this people all these words and they say to you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? What is our iniquity? What is the sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord, and have gone after other gods, and have served and worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and not kept my law. And because you have done worse than your fathers. For behold, every one of you follows his stubborn evil will, refusing to listen to me. Therefore I will hurl you out of this land, into a land that neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. 
Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country, and out of all the countries where he had driven them. For I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. Behold, I am sending for many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. But first, I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land with the carcasses of their detestable idols, and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. O Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but lies, worthless things in which there is no profit. Can man make for himself gods? Such are not gods. Therefore, behold, I will make them know. This once I will make them know my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. Chapter 17 The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With a point of diamond it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. While their children remember their altars and their asherim beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains in the open country, your wealth and all your treasuries I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave to you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever." Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good home. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes for its leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind, to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by justice. In the midst of his days they will leave him, and at his end he will be a fool. A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved for you are my praise. Behold, they say to me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. I have not run away from being your shepherd, nor have I desired the day of sickness. You know what came out of my lips. It was before your face. Be not a terror to me. You are my refuge in the day of disaster. Let those be put to shame who persecute me, but let me not be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but let me not be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of disaster. Destroy them with double destruction. Thus said the Lord to me, Go and stand in the people's gate, by which the kings of Judah enter, and by which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem who enter by these gates. Thus says the Lord, Take care for the sake of your lives, and do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day, or bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, and do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath, or do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy, as I commanded your fathers. Yet they did not listen, or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, that they might not hear and receive instruction. But if you listen to me, declares the Lord, 
and bring in no burden by the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but keep the Sabbath day holy, and do no work on it. Then there shall enter by the gates of this city kings and princes who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their officials, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall be inhabited forever. And people shall come from the cities of Judah and the places around Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the Shephelah, from the hill country, and from the Negev, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings and frankincense, and bringing thank offerings to the house of the Lord. But if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy, and not to bear a burden and enter by the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and shall not be quenched. If you're looking for encouragement for life's journey, a better understanding of the Bible, or an honest look at Scripture, check out the Christ-Centered Journey. I'm your host, Dan Shipton, and I'd like to invite you to check us out. Mondays through Fridays, we air new programs. It's a daily podcast that's built around building one another up as Christ followers in this journey we call life. So why don't you join us by looking us up on your podcasting host for the Christ-Centered Journey. Chapter 14 begins with the description of the terrible drought that was devastating Judah. If rain doesn't fall at the appropriate time in that part of the world, the results can be devastating, as seen here. It affected everyone, from the rich to the poor, from the farmer to the animals themselves. And it seems as though this drought leads to a cry out for mercy. This could be a plea from the lips of Jeremiah, but I think that it's more likely that these words reflect the presumptuous attitude of the people. They believed that they could call on God whenever they were in trouble. In other words, they weren't really concerned about their backsliding as much as they were about their current physical situation. They felt like they had trapped God in an indefensible position. They taunted him that his honor was at stake, so he must do something for the sake of his name and reputation. What they didn't understand was that it was necessary for him to punish them in order to protect his reputation. If the people were truly confessing their sins, God would have revoked their punishment. Jeremiah repeatedly pled with the people to return to the Lord. His appeals implied that God would forgive if they returned. The only explanation is that they did not and would not confess with broken hearts. The same way that people still sin today but presumptuously claim the promises of God's blessings. The issue is hypocrisy. Even though they called God the hope of Israel and their Savior in times of distress, their words were tinged with sarcasm. They accused him of being a stranger in the land, though they were the ones who had made themselves strangers to him. They compared him to a traveler passing through who had no intimate relationship or interest in the people or its land. But they forgot that he had made the covenant with them. He owned the land and he brought them there to live in it. They continued their accusations against God through verse 9. And this is the main reason why I believe that this isn't Jeremiah speaking. Because some of the words are so harsh and it doesn't match Jeremiah's normal, humble pattern of bringing a complaint. But, beginning in verse 10, God responds with his rejection. They could not presume upon him endlessly, and then expect him to respond whenever they beckoned him. They were proud to be the chosen people bearing his name, but they shamelessly pursued other gods. And by doing so, they had rejected him. Now, he was rejecting them, and was going to punish them for their sins. Then, for the third time, God told Jeremiah not to pray for the people. His refusal to hear prayers of the people was not due to his indifference or his lack of compassion. Rather, it was because he knew that their hearts were hardened and that they were not going to change. Praying would just be a waste of Jeremiah's time. The people assumed that if they observed certain rituals, such as fasting and burnt offerings and grain offerings, that God would relent and forgive. However, no ritualistic expression of repentance moves God. 
Instead of forgiving and accepting them, God announced that he was going to destroy them. The drought that they were experiencing was only the beginning of their calamities. Warfare, starvation, and disease would also be their lot. In verse 13, however, we see Jeremiah's love for the people spill over. He protested that the blame for the people's sin should be placed on the false prophets. They had assured the people that Judah would not experience war or famine, but only lasting peace. And so he asks if the people should be held responsible for just believing their leaders. And God agrees with Jeremiah to an extent. The prophets were leading the people astray by their reassuring words, but God had not appointed them or spoken to them. They were deceiving the people. They deluded themselves to believe that they were actually speaking God's words, although their messages came from their own minds. These words contain a warning for today's preachers that we must be careful not to cloak our own desires under the guise of being God's desires. This is the importance of each believer to be responsible in discernment when listening to these prophetic voices. Judgment will come on those false prophets, but God rejected Jeremiah's appeal that the people should not be held accountable for believing the false prophets. So Jeremiah continues with a lament and a prayer on behalf of the people, even though God had told him not to burden himself with it three times. This almost reads like a memorial service for the death of Judah while they are still alive. Have you ever imagined your own funeral? What people will say about you once you are gone? What part of you will live on? Well, Jeremiah is giving the people a glimpse into this reality, and it's not a great picture. But then in verse 20, he turns and begins to confess and plead on behalf of the people, much in the same way that Moses did previously and that Ezra will do in the future. He appeals to God for mercy three times. The first time he appeals on the basis of God's character. The second was an appeal not to dishonor his glorious throne. And throne here is used as a reference to the temple, which was considered to be the dwelling place of God among his people. Because they believed that God was enthroned in the temple, they were confident that no harm could come to them. But they didn't understand that God sought to dwell in their hearts, not in a building. Finally, Jeremiah appealed to God not to carry out the covenant promises of judgment on Israel. God had been merciful. He had not brought judgment upon them sooner. But there is a coming day when God's mercy must be met with his justice. For those who are unrepentant, the hammer of God's justice falls on them. But in Christ, we have a haven in God's grace because Jesus has borne our suffering and our sorrow. Jeremiah concludes by expressing that worthless idols could not bring rain. Jeremiah knew that the Lord was their only hope. The people did not. They trusted in Baal, the Canaanite storm god, to provide rain at the right time if they brought their sacrifices and offerings to him. Jeremiah's admission of Judah's sin and his belief in God as their only hope could not serve to appease God's anger. One person, however devout, cannot confess the sins or the faith of another. God does not chide Jeremiah for his praying on behalf of the people, but he tells him at the beginning of chapter 15 that even if Moses and Samuel joined him in his prayer, it wouldn't make any difference. Each person will be held in judgment for their own sins and their own relationship with God. God could no longer tolerate the stubbornness of the people. Send them away from my presence was his decision. And the word there for send is the same word that we find in Exodus chapter 5 verse 1. There it's translated, let my people go. I think this is a play on the Exodus language. God is telling Jeremiah to let my people go. However, here... It has an ominous meaning. And God anticipated that the people would respond to this, saying, Where should we go? And his answer was harsh. It sounds like he's saying, I won't help you. I no longer care what happens to you. Their destination would be death, sword, starvation, and captivity, the usual accompaniments of the horrors of war. We've already heard a couple of Jeremiah's complaints back in chapters 11 and 12, but here in chapter 15, we get one of his most bitter complaints. I mean, imagine this from his perspective. He begins proclaiming the word of the Lord, and the people call him a traitor and plot to kill him. 
But then, during this famine, they confess some of their sin and ask for mercy. But then God rejects it and rejects Jeremiah's intercession. It seems hopeless. What is Jeremiah supposed to do? He's mourning for his people, and he's even worried about his own life. And God gives him the space to pour out his heart. The urgency of Jeremiah's request is revealed in the way that he commands God four times in verse 15. This wasn't presumption on Jeremiah's part, but evidence that he had the kind of relationship with God that permitted him to have a bold and candid speech before him. Then, for a beautiful moment in verse 16, Jeremiah relives the exhilaration that he had experienced when he accepted God's calling. He described the acceptance of God's messages as eating God's words. This reminds me of Ezekiel, where he also ate a scroll. Jeremiah, at that time, had no awareness of the problems that he would encounter as the Lord's spokesman. He only remembered the delight of being chosen. Now, Sadly, this is the only text in the book that says that Jeremiah found joy in his call. In tomorrow's reading in chapter 20, Jeremiah will realize the full responsibility of consuming the word of the Lord. As Jeremiah reflects on what it had cost him to accept his prophetic commission, he felt the heavy hand of the Lord on him, separating him from his people and constraining him. And it's important to know that there is often a price to pay for leadership. It may be the price of loneliness, misunderstanding, or separation from human associations. Jeremiah was so identified with God's thoughts that he experienced the same indignation that God felt for the people's sins. Jeremiah struggled to understand this and was unfortunately led to a mistaken conclusion, that conclusion being that God had deceived him. Jeremiah apparently had forgotten the words recorded in his commission in chapter 1, verses 17 to 19. They speak of persecution and rejection. And he, at this point, has stepped out of bounds. He compares God to a deceiving brook, after having just recently proclaimed that God is the fountain of living water. He forgot God, and he has formed his expectations of God that didn't include rejection by his people or failure to convince them that he was God's spokesman. He had not anticipated that suffering could also accompany service for God. Jeremiah needs to go back to the initial experience and remember that God's promise includes his merciful and comforting presence, but it does not include the removal from persecution and oppression. In essence, to follow God means to be willing to face such obstacles. Are you willing? Is he worth it to you? At this point, God breaks in on Jeremiah's pity party. By accusing God of deceiving him and of failing him when he needed him, Jeremiah has overstepped the bounds of what a servant of God can say. His harsh accusations were about to cost Jeremiah his prophetic ministry. The Lord rebuked him, but was willing to give him a second chance. If Jeremiah would repent of his words and his attitude, then God would restore his prophetic ministry. Jeremiah could not be God's prophet by mouthing worthless words. But if he would speak words worthy of a prophet, he could once again serve the Lord. God cautioned him that his task was to speak, and the people's responsibility was to turn to him. He must not, however, turn to the people that is, compromise his words, or conform to the people's beliefs in order to gain their approval. And Christians in general are confronted with the same temptation today to conform to the patterns of this world, and some find themselves tempted to even compromise their lifestyle in order to be accepted by their so-called friends. Jeremiah's response to God's offer of a second chance isn't recorded, and it wasn't necessary for him to do so. Jeremiah did repent, and he did return. He continued to be God's spokesman until the fall of Jerusalem and beyond. The exchange between Jeremiah and the Lord in these verses serve as a reminder of the humanity of this prophet of God. When a person accepts the call, God expects their total obedience. But it also serves as a reminder that faithfulness in serving God doesn't exempt the servant from hardship and rejection by friends and family. 
The passage also teaches that the reward for faithful service may, in fact, be more difficult service because Jeremiah's most difficult years of ministry are still ahead of him. And I told you there was a lot in today's reading. We're only halfway through. In chapter 16, we see God's command to Jeremiah that we mentioned in the introduction to the book. This command not to marry or have children. Now, this command would have caused Jeremiah even more inner turmoil. The Old Testament teaches that God ordained marriage and that sons and daughters are a blessing. I'm not sure which prophetic calling would have been worse, Jeremiah's call to celibacy or Hosea's call to marry a wife of harlotry. So why does God tell Jeremiah not to get married? Well, the question can be best answered by understanding the command to Jeremiah as one of his symbolic acts. Now, usually these symbolic acts would cause a temporary inconvenience or some kind of embarrassment to a prophet in order to communicate the Lord's message more effectively. However, in Jeremiah's case, he was denied the happiness and comfort of a family as long as he lived. By refraining from marriage, Jeremiah would be a constant reminder of the imminence of the nation's destruction. It was not a time to enjoy normal family life or to have children. They would die of deadly diseases in such great numbers that there would be no time for mourning or proper burial. Jeremiah's life added credence to his message. To preach coming destruction, but then to store up treasures on earth is a confusion of the message. His life serves as a reminder that it may be necessary to abandon our plans and desires if God's purposes are to be accomplished through us. Jeremiah embodies the teaching of Jesus who said, If a man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Furthermore, Jeremiah was also commanded not to go into a funeral house to express that God has withdrawn his comfort However, I'm sure that people saw it instead as him being uncaring and callous. He was also forbidden from celebrating. His refusal to join in the festivities would further alienate him and add to his reputation as an eccentric. This behavior was necessary, however, to accent his message of condemnation and judgment. The coming disaster made celebration absurd. Normal life was coming to an end when all sounds of joy and gladness including weddings, would no longer be heard in Judah. After announcing again the coming destruction and judgment, in chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, God gives hope of restoration. The contrast here is jarring. God announced a regathering of the people and a restoration that would be called a second exodus. This will be further expounded as we get into chapters 30 to 33 in a few days. But this judgment is on this sinful generation, This withdrawal of blessing will only be temporary. However, for now, it is impossible to escape the coming judgment. God's fishermen and hunters will capture those who try to escape. I couldn't help when reading this to picture the image of fishers of men that Jesus paints as he's calling his apostles. We are equipped by God to be fishers of men, but this time it's not for judgment, but for salvation. God has already saved his people, and he sends out his people as fishermen to collect them like harvesters into a ripe field. All right, finally, on to chapter 17. In verses 1 through 4, God made it clear that Judah was going to lose its inheritance through its own fault. The people would be carried into exile to an unfamiliar land because they had kindled the Lord's anger. Their idolatry had earned his permanent hostility. It says it would burn forever. The message was clear. Disobedience to God's laws is going to incur punishment. But then, in verses 5 through 8, we see the offer of a choice. And that choice feels very reminiscent of Psalm 1. These verses set forth two ways to live. One, to trust in human resources. Or two, to trust in divine resources. The person who trusts in self and human resources will have a dried up, empty life that's compared to a barren and unattractive desert plant struggling for survival. But even when the drought and the heat come, a tree planted by water, a picture of the divine resources, think of the fountain of living water, will flourish. Its leaves will remain green and it will bear fruit. This suggests that a person can endure the adversities of life 
in Christ, without anxiety, showing stability and productivity. This is the Old Testament equivalent of the abundant life that Jesus mentioned in John chapter 10. Verses 9 through 13 present a refutation of the popular belief that people are basically good. The human heart has an unlimited capacity for wickedness and deceit, so that human resources are incapable of dealing with it. The only remedy is a radical change, nothing less than rebirth. Jeremiah understood that the Lord, not the temple itself, was Israel's only hope. As we come to verse 14, we get Jeremiah's fourth confession or complaint. Jeremiah addressed God and pleaded for deliverance. His complaint or lament is recorded in verses 15 and 18, and Jeremiah spoke of his history of faithfulness to God and called for his enemy to be destroyed. Finally, he revealed his trust in the Lord. Now, Jeremiah's vindictive words can sometimes make modern readers uncomfortable. I mean, we would prefer to hear him speak the pious words of, Father, forgive them. His call for vengeance is another reminder of his humanity. Jeremiah reacted the way that most of us would react in similar circumstances. Finally, the last section of chapter 17, which some commentators have called Jeremiah's miscellaneous file, because it just kind of feels like it's unrelated, contains a warning about Sabbath observance. The person who kept the Sabbath revealed his willingness to obey God in every area of their life. It also gave an opportunity for him to worship God. Sabbath laws, as well as all the Mosaic laws, if observed, were evidences of trust in God, whether or not the person understood the reasons for the commands. The true spirit of obedience doesn't ask God why, but accepts his commands as good. However, Judah's response to the Sabbath regulations were indicative of the people's attitude towards all God's command. They did not listen or pay attention. They were stiff-necked, and they would not respond to his discipline. Tomorrow, we will go to the potter's house, and we'll hear about how those words that went down so sweetly at Jeremiah's commissioning have now turned into heartburn. I hope you'll join me then. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash dbrpodcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow, keep reading and keep worshiping.